Hello, I'm Matthew Cafiero, and I would like to introduce our online novel study. The novel we will be reading is Siddhartha by German author Hermann Hesse. Chapter 2 With the Samanas In the evening of this day, they caught up with the ascetics, the skinny samanas, and offered them their companionship and obedience. They were accepted. Siddhartha gave his garments to a poor brahmin in the street. He wore nothing more than the loincloth and the earth-colored, unsewn cloak. He ate only once a day and never something cooked. He fasted for 15 days. He fasted for 28 days. The flesh waned from his thighs and cheeks. Feverish dreams flickered from his enlarged eyes. Long nails grew slowly on his parched fingers, and a dry, shaggy beard grew on his chin. His glance turned icy when he encountered women. His mouth twitched with contempt when he walked through a city of nicely dressed people. Text note, an ascetic is someone who practices severe self-discipline, abstention from, from indulgence. This is someone who fasts, who avoids temptation in physical or emotional pleasures, and lives only in the spirit. So Siddhartha and the other samanas practice fasting drinking only water, eating very little or not at all for days at a time. They do this so that their bodies will be better able to prevent them from distractions of the physical world, and they can focus on their spiritual journey. He saw merchants trading princes hunting, mourners wailing for their dead, whores offering themselves, physicians trying to help the sick, priests determining the most suitable day for seeding, lovers loving, mothers nursing their children. And all of this was not worthy of one look from his eye. It all lied. It all stank. It all stank of lies. It all pretended to be meaningful and joyful and beautiful and it all was just concealed putrefaction. The world tasted bitter. Life was torture. A goal stood before Siddhartha, a single goal, to become empty, empty of thirst, empty of wishing, empty of dreams, empty of joy and sorrow, dead to himself, not to be a self anymore, to find tranquility with an emptied head, to be open to miracles in unselfish thoughts. That was his goal. Text note. Here we see a practice of abnegation. Abnegation is the idea that by eliminating all distractions, physical, mental, emotional, and even spiritual, you can become an empty vessel uh, an open container which the universe will fill with enlightenment and miracles. Many religions have versions of this idea. Once all of myself was overcome and had died, once every desire and every urge was silent in the heart, then the ultimate part of me had to awake, the innermost of my being, which is no longer myself, the great secret. Silently, Siddhartha exposed himself to burning rays of the sun directly above, glowing with pain, glowing with thirst, and stood there until he neither felt any pain nor thirst anymore. Silently, he stood there in the rainy season, 
From his hair, the water was dripping over freezing shoulders, over freezing hips and legs, and the penitent stood there until he could not feel the cold in his shoulders and legs anymore, until they were silent, until they were quiet. Silently, he cowered in the thorny bushes. Blood dripped from the burning skin, from festering wounds dripped pus, and Siddhartha stayed rigidly, stayed motionless, until no blood flowed anymore, until nothing stung anymore, until nothing burned anymore. Siddhartha sat upright and learned to breathe sparingly, learned to get along with only a few breaths, learned to stop breathing. He learned, beginning with the breath, to calm the beat of his heart, learned to reduce the beats of his heart until they were only a few and almost none. Instructed by the oldest of the samanas, Siddhartha practiced self-denial, practiced meditation according to new samana rules. A heron flew over the bamboo forest, and Siddhartha accepted the heron into his soul, flew over forest and mountains, was a heron, ate fish, felt the pangs of a heron's hunger, spoke the heron's croak, died a heron's death. A dead jackal was lying on the sandy bank, and Siddhartha's soul slipped inside the body, was the dead jackal, lay on the banks, got bloated, stank, decayed, was dismembered by hyenas, was skinned by vultures, turned into a skeleton, turned to dust, was blown across the fields. And Siddhartha's soul returned, had died, had decayed, was scattered as dust, had tasted the gloomy intoxication of the cycle, awaited a new thirst like a hunter in the gap, where he could escape from the cycle, where the end of the causes, where an eternity without suffering began. He killed his senses, he killed his memory, he slipped out of his self into thousands of other forms, was an animal, was carrion, was stone, was wood, was water, and awoke every time to find his old self again, sunshine or moon, was his self again, turned round in the cycle, felt thirst, overcame the thirst, felt new thirst. Text note. Siddhartha here is practicing the ultimate idea of abnegation. By emptying himself up to the universe, his soul, his spirit, experiences the cycle of life, death, and reincarnation, rebirth. The ultimate goal of Hindu practice, and later of Buddhism, is to escape the cycle to reach a point where all self has been negated, to become one with the universe and no longer be on the wheel of reincarnation. And yet, despite his ability to go into thousands of different forms, at the end of every test, Siddhartha finds himself back in his body, battling thirst, Batter, battling his needs. He isn't able to take the final step of not returning to his body. Siddhartha had learned a lot when he was with the Samanas, and many ways of leading away from the self he learned to go. He went the way of self-denial, by means of pain, through voluntary suffering, and overcoming pain, hunger, thirst, tiredness. 
he went the way of self-denial by means of meditation, through imagining the mind to be void of all conceptions. These are other ways he learned to go. A thousand times he left his self. For hours and days he remained in the non-self. But though the ways led away from the self, their end, nevertheless, always led back to the self. Though Siddhartha fled from the self a thousand times, stayed in nothingness, stayed in the animal, in the stone, the return was inevitable. Inescapable was the hour when he found himself back in the sunshine, or in the moonlight, in the shade, or in the rain, and was once again his self and Siddhartha, and felt again the agony of the cycle which had been forced upon him. By his side lived Govinda, his shadow, walked the same paths, undertook the same efforts. They rarely spoke to one another, other than the service and the exercises required. Occasionally, the two of them went through the villages to beg for food for themselves and their teachers. How do you think, Govinda, Siddhartha spoke one day while begging this way, how do you think did we progress? Did we reach any goals? Govinda answered, We have learned, and we'll continue learning. You'll be a great Samana, Siddhartha. Quickly you've learned every exercise. Often the old Samanas have admired you. One day you'll be a holy man, O Siddhartha. Quoth Siddhartha, I can't help but feel that it is not like this, my friend. What I've learned, being among the Samanas up to this day, this, O Govinda, I could have learned more quickly and by simpler means. In every tavern of that part of town where the whorehouses are, my friend, among carters and gamblers, I could have learned it. Said Govinda, Siddhartha is putting me on. How could you have learned meditation, holding your breath, insensitivity against hunger and pain, there among these wretched people? And Siddhartha said quietly, as if he was talking to himself, What is meditation? What is leaving one's body? What is fasting? What is holding one's breath? It is fleeing from the self. It is a short escape of the agony of being a self. It is a short numbing of the senses against the pain and the pointlessness of life. The same escape, the same short numbing, is what the driver of an ox cart finds in the inn, drinking a few bowls of rice wine or fermented coconut milk. Then he won't feel his self anymore, and he won't feel the pains of life anymore. Then he finds a short numbing of the senses. When he falls asleep over his bowl of rice wine, he'll find the same that Siddhartha and Govinda find when they escape their bodies through long exercises, staying in the non-self. That is how it is, O Govinda. Text note. Siddhartha is making an argument that the Samanas are simply providing one method, one route, to escaping from the self, from escaping from their lives. But the ordinary people of the town, by simply relaxing from their work, by having a drink, by laying their head down, have the same kind of break. That what he and Govinda have learned is simply a different way of achieving what all people achieve, a short break from the self. Quoth Govinda, You say so, O friend, and yet you know that Siddhartha is no driver of an ox cart, and a Samana is no drunkard. It's true that a drinker numbs his senses. It's true that he briefly escapes and rests, but he'll return from the delusion. He finds everything to be unchanged, has not become wiser, has gathered no enlightenment, 
has not risen several steps. And Siddhartha spoke with a smile. I do not know. I've never been a drunkard. But that I, Siddhartha, find only a short numbing of senses in my exercises and meditations, and I am just as far removed from wisdom, from salvation, as a child in the mother's womb, this I know, O Govinda, this I know. And once again, another time, when Siddhartha left the forest together with Govinda to beg for some food in the village for their brothers and teachers, Siddhartha began to speak and said, What now, O Govinda, might we be on the right path? Might we get closer to enlightenment? Might we get closer to salvation? Or do we perhaps live in a circle? We who have thought we were escaping the cycle. Quoth Govinda, We've learned a lot, Siddhartha. There is still much to learn. We're not going around in circles. We are moving up. The circle is a spiral. We have already ascended many a level. Text note. Siddhartha again is feeling frustrated, feeling that he is relearning lessons that he has already learned, that his study is taking him no closer to true enlightenment. Govinda, on the other hand, views what he has learned as progress. He doesn't feel close to the goal, but he feels far from where he started and measures that as progress. Siddhartha answered, How old, would you think, is our oldest Samana, our venerable teacher? Quoth Govinda, our oldest one might be about 60 years of age. And Siddhartha, he has lived for 60 years and has not reached the nirvana. He'll turn 70 and 80, and you and me, we will grow just as old, and we'll do our exercises, and we'll fast, and we'll meditate, but we will not reach the nirvana. He won't, and we won't. O oh, Govinda, I believe out of all of the samanas out there, perhaps not a single one, not a single one will reach the nirvana. We find comfort. We find numbness. We learn feats to deceive others. But the most important thing, the path of paths, we will not find. Text note. This is the first appearance in the text of the word nirvana. Nirvana has a number of definitions, some of them very complex. My favorite definition is nirvana is the state of existing without strife that can only be reached without struggle. So it is a status of being where you no longer feel that you have any conflict and you cannot reach it through effort. It simply comes upon you when you have abandoned all efforts. And Siddhartha argues here that the samanas are moving, whether in a spiral or in a circle, they are moving no closer to the center. They're never getting closer to the nirvana, to the state of enlightenment. The most important thing, he says, the path of paths, the way to get to nirvana, you will not find by following the paths of the samana. If you only wouldn't speak such terrible words, Siddhartha, spoke Govinda, how could it be that among so many learned men, among so many Brahmins, among so many austere and venerable Samanas, among so many who are searching, so many who are eagerly trying, so many holy men, not one will find the path of paths? But Siddhartha said in a voice, a quiet voice, a slightly sad voice, a slightly mocking voice. Soon, Govinda, your friend will leave the path of the Samanas. He has walked along your side for so long, 
I'm suffering of thirst, O Govinda, and on this long path of Asamana, my thirst has remained as strong as ever. I've always thirsted for knowledge, have always been full of questions. I have asked the Brahmins year after year, and I've asked the Holy Vedas year after year, and I have asked the devote Samanas year after year. Perhaps, O Govinda, it had been just as well had it been just as smart and just as profitable if I had asked the hornbill bird or the chimpanzee. Text note. Siddhartha here is showing his frustration. His friendship with Govinda allows him to express how disappointed and upset he is that the path he has taken has led him no closer to the truth he's seeking, that he believes he should be able to achieve. It took me a long time, and I am not finished learning this yet, O Govinda, that there is nothing to be learned. There is indeed no such thing, I believe, as what we refer to as learning. There is, O oh my friend, just one knowledge. This is everywhere. This is Atman. This is within me, and within you, and within every creature. And so I'm starting to believe that this knowledge has no worse enemy than the desire to know it than learning. At this, Govinda stopped on the path, rose his hands and spoke, If you, Siddhartha, only would not bother your friend with this kind of talk, truly your words stir up fear in my heart. And just consider, what would become of the sanctity of prayer? What of the venerability of the Brahmins caste? What of the holiness of the Samanas, if it was as you say, if there was no learning? But what, O oh Siddhartha, what would then become of all of this what is holy, what is precious, what is venerable in the earth. Text note. Siddhartha has reached his first important realization that the knowledge he seeks cannot be learned by learning. He cannot study his way to enlightenment, which means that all of the study he has done up to this point has brought him no closer to enlightenment its only benefit has been to prove that study, in fact, does not teach, that what he wishes to learn can't be learned through teaching. The fact that I am teaching this to you in a book which I have assigned is an irony that I leave for your own imaginations. Govinda has an interesting response. Govinda essentially says, well, let's say for a minute that you're right, Siddhartha. Let's say that what we're trying to learn can't be taught, then why is there teaching? Why, what, what value is there to all of the prayers and the study and the sacrifices? And, and, and if organized religious thinking can't bring us to enlightenment, then what's it for? He rejects the idea that the, what he wants to learn can't be taught because study is his only way of understanding. There's an old saying, when your only tool is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. And this is where Govinda finds himself right now, unwilling to believe that the tools that have brought him to where he is now are not the right tools to finish the job, to help him, help him someday follow Siddhartha into nirvana, into the place of enlightenment. And Govinda mumbled a verse to himself, a verse from an Upanishad. He who ponderingly of a purified spirit loses himself in the meditation of Atman, Unexpressible by words is the blissfulness of his heart. But Siddhartha remained silent. He thought about the words which Govinda had said to him, and thought the words through to their end. Yes, he thought, standing there with his head low, what would remain of all that which seemed to us to be holy? What remains? What can stand the test? And he shook his head.
At one time, when the two young men had lived among the Samanas for about three years and had shared their exercises, some news, a rumor, a myth reached them after being retold many times. A man had appeared, Gotama by name, the Exalted One, the Buddha. He had overcome the suffering of the world in himself and had halted the cycle of rebirths. He was said to wander through the land, teaching, surrounded by disciples, without possession, without home, without a wife, in the yellow cloak of an ascetic, but with a cheerful brow, a man of bliss, and Brahmins and princes would bow down before him and would become his students. Text note. The religion of Hinduism gave birth to the religion of Buddhism. Gautama Buddha, sometimes called Saltama, sometimes called the Syad or the Sayanat, and other names, was, according to the traditions, a man who had found the path to nirvana, had achieved what, Sir, what Siddhartha and Govinda have been trying to achieve. And as word spread, there was a conflict between people who followed the old traditions and people who broke off to follow this new master. There are obvious connections in this story to the story of the Jews in Israel and the arrival of the Messiah. You see similar stories in some other faiths. This myth, this rumor, this legend resounded. Its fragrance rose up here and there in the towns. The Brahmins spoke of it, and in the forest, the Samanas. Again and again, the name of Gotma, the Buddha, reached the ears of the young men, with good and with bad talk, with praise and with defamation. It was as if the plague had broken out in a country, and news had been spreading around that in one or another place there was a man, a wise man, a knowledgeable one, whose word and breath was enough to heal everyone who had been infected with the pestilence. And as such news would go through the land, and everyone would talk about it, Many would believe, many would doubt, but many would get on their way as soon as possible to seek the wise man, the helper, just like this myth ran through the land, that fragrant myth of Gautama, the Buddha, the wise man of the family of Sakya. He possessed, so the believers said, the highest enlightenment. He remembered his previous lives. He had reached the nirvana and never returned into the cycle, was never again submerged in the murky river of physical forms. Many wonderful and unbelievable things were reported of him. He had performed miracles. He had overcome the devil. He had spoken to the gods. But his enemies and disbelievers said, this Gautama was a vain seducer. He would spend his days in luxury scorned the offerings, was without learning, and knew neither exercises nor self-castigation. The myth of the Buddha sounded sweet. The scent of magic flowed from these reports. After all, the world was sick. Life was hard to bear. And behold, here a source seemed to spring forth. Here a messenger seemed to call out, comforting, mild, full of noble promises. Everywhere where the rumor of Buddha was heard, everywhere in the lands of India, the young men listened up, felt a longing, felt hope. And among the Brahmins' sons of the towns and villages, every pilgrim and stranger was welcome when he brought news of him, the Exalted One, the Sakyamuni. Textual note. Sakya is the clan or family 
of Gotama, the Buddha. Sakyamuni is a word which may translate as man of the Sakya or someone belonging to the Sakya clan. The myth had also reached the Samanas, the forest, and also Siddhartha, and also Govinda. Slowly, drop by drop, every drop laden with hope, every drop laden with doubt. They rarely talked about it, because the oldest one of the Samanas did not like this myth. He had heard that this alleged Buddha used to be an ascetic before and had lived in the forest, but had then turned back to luxury and worldly pleasures, and he had no high opinion of this Gotma, the Buddha. Oh, Siddhartha, Govinda spoke one day to his friend, today I was in the village, and a Brahmin invited me into his house, and in his house there was the son of a Brahmin from Magadha, who has seen the Buddha with his very own eyes, and has heard him teach. Verily, this made my chest ache when I breathed, and I thought to myself, if only I would too, if only we both would too, Siddhartha and me, live to see the hour when we will hear the teachings from the mouth of this perfected man. Speak, friend, wouldn't we want to go there too and listen to the teachings from the Buddha's mouth? Quoth Siddhartha, Always, O Govinda, I had thought, Govinda would stay with the Samanas. Always I had believed his goal was to live to be 60 and 70 years of age and keep on practicing these feats and exercises which are becoming a Samana. But behold, I had not known Govinda well enough. I knew too little of his heart. So now you, my faithful friend, want to take a new path and go there where the Buddha spreads his teachings. Quote Govinda, You're mocking me. Mock if you like, Siddhartha. But have you not also developed a desire and eagerness to hear these teachings? And have you not at one time said to me you would not walk the path of the Samanas for much longer? Text note. Govinda points out that Siddhartha had previously complained that what he wanted to learn, he could not learn staying with the Samanas. And even though Govinda himself had suggested that they stay, he now sees an option in the teachings of Gautama the Buddha to find a true path, to find enlightenment without the exercises of the Samanas. At this, Siddhartha laughed in his very own manner, in which his voice assumed a touch of sadness and a touch of mockery, and he said, well, Govinda, you've spoken well. You remembered correctly. If you only remembered the other thing as well you have heard from me, which is that I have grown distrustful and tired against teachings and learning, and that my faith in words, which are brought to us by teachers, is small. But let's do it, my dear. I am willing to listen to these teachings, though in my heart, I believe that we've already tasted the best fruit of these teachings. Text note. Siddhartha points out to Govinda that Siddhartha has already expressed his doubt that what he wants to learn can be taught. The teaching he is looking for cannot be taught. The learning cannot be learned. It is something which has to occur within the self. It's something which has to happen to you rather than something you can struggle towards. But having no better solution and wanting to accommodate his friend, he says, well, we can go listen to this guy, the Buddha, hear what he has to say, but I doubt it will amount to anything. Here we begin to see one of the characteristics of Siddhartha as the hero on his journey. Siddhartha is very confident 
to the point of egotistical. He seems very humble, but he never ever doubts in his own ability, and he never doubts his own decisions. He has decided that he will go along with Govinda, but he also does not expect to learn anything from the experience. Said Govinda, Your willingness delights my heart, but tell me, how should this be possible? How should the Gautama's teachings, even before we have heard them, have already revealed their best fruit to us? Quoth Siddhartha, Let us eat this fruit and wait for the rest, O Govinda. But this fruit, which we already now received thanks to the Gautama, consisted in him calling us away from the Samanas. Whether he also has other and better things to give us, O oh friend, let us await with calm hearts. Text note. Siddhartha says, Maybe the best thing we can learn from the Buddha is that we should have left the Samanas, as I already believed. But we'll go along and see if maybe he has something else. On this very same day, Siddhartha informed the oldest one of the Samanas of his decision, that he wanted to leave him. He informed the oldest one with all of the courtesy and modesty becoming of a younger one and a student. But the Samana became angry because the two young men wanted to leave him and talked loudly and used crude swear words. Govinda was startled and became embarrassed but Siddhartha just put his mouth close to Govinda's ear and whispered to him, Now I will show the old man that I've learned something from him. Positioning himself closely in front of the Samana, with a concentrated soul, he captured the old man's glance with his glances, deprived him of his power, made him mute, took away his free will, subdued him under his own will, commanded him to do silently whatever he demanded him to do. The old man became mute. His eyes became motionless. His will was paralyzed. His arms were hanging down. Without power, he had fallen victim to Siddhartha's spell. But Siddhartha's thoughts brought the Samana under their control and he had to carry out what they commanded. And thus the old man made several bows, performed gestures of blessing, spoke stammeringly a godly wish for a good journey, and the young men returned the bow with thanks, returned the wish, and went on their way with salutations. Text note. Here Siddhartha proves that he has mastered the ways of the Samanas, the discipline, spiritual and mental. He uses the force of his will almost as a magical power to make the angry old Samana show them respect. He drains the man's will, makes him bow and be polite and wish them good luck and give them blessings. This is an example of Siddhartha's power and strength, his spiritual learning, and the skills that he has acquired in his studies. But it also shows that Siddhartha is competitive, that he demands respect, and that he expects success in his test against the old man. On the way, Govinda said, Oh, Siddhartha, you have learned more from the Samanas than I knew. It is hard, it is very hard, to cast a spell on an old Samana. Truly, if you had stayed there, you would have soon learned to walk on water. I do not seek to walk on water, said Siddhartha. Let old Samanas be content with such feats. Text note. Govinda is impressed and amazed 
with his friend's accomplishment. And he points out that had they continued along this path, Siddhartha would be capable of such supernatural feats as walking on water. Notice that Siddhartha doesn't say that he never could, never would, or even can't walk on water. He says, I do not seek to walk on water. Well, that's not what I'm going for, he tells Savinda. He, he tells Govinda. He says, let old Samanas be content with such feats. Those are tricks. I'm after serious learning. Something to think about as we reach the end of chapter two, Among the Samanas. That brings us to the end of chapter two of Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse. Chapter two, With the Samanas, detailed the journey of Siddhartha and his friend Govinda away from the learnings of the Brahmins and the home of his father out into the wilderness with the ascetics, the self-demanding, self-sacrificing Samanas. At the end of which chapter, they learn of the teachings of Buddha, Gotama, the Enlightened One, and Siddhartha and Govinda agree to leave the Samanas to pursue further learning from the Buddha. On the way out of their experience with the Samanas, Siddhartha demonstrates the amazing spiritual power that he has learned in his studies. Thank you for reading With the Samanas from Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse. Narration and illustrations by Matthew Caffiero.